Okay, um, we're looking at a, a simple structure here as a beam supported on two fixed joints. Um, it has three loads on it, or three forces, active forces acting on it. First one, 50 newtons acting at 45 degrees to the vertical. The first one directly overhead, pushing down almost at the centre of the beam. Well, exactly at the centre. The third one off to one side at 60 degrees to the vertical or to the horizontal and that's a 40 newton force. Okay, to solve this problem graphically, which is what we're looking at, um, we need to set up the first thing is a, an accurate diagram. Well, I've done, I've done that here. We've got a, a scale which I've set up for my distances, which is one meter equals 20 millimeters. So measuring across here, you'll see that um, what I've done is uh, organized one meter to be 20 millimetres, therefore 10 millimetres is 0.5 metres and um, 30 millimetres becomes 1.5 metres and so forth all the way across. Now it's fairly simple because it's loaded up evenly. Alright, the, the next stage once you set up an accurate scaled diagram of the, um, the distances is to set up the forces and the forces are acting at an angle and they have a magnitude and they have a direction and a sense. So the magnitude is uh, given to us, and we measure that off, and I've got a second scale up here you can see for magnitude, 5 millimetres is 10 newtons. So just the degrees I've got simply by using a protractor, just placing a protractor on the certain spot like this, marking off, in this case, 60 degrees, drawing a line down here. Then I measure along that line for, according to my scale, 5 millimetres is 10 newtons. 40 newtons then will correspond to a 20 millimetre distance and so forth. So these are accurately scaled and I have my accurate free body diagram. Now from that the next stage is to construct a force polygon and the force polygon because we're being asked to calculate the magnitude sense and direction of the resultant of these three forces acting on the beam. So to work out the resultant, we don't need to consider the reactions at the supports. We're simply looking at the combination of these three forces and the magnitude, direction, sense, and actually line of and point of action of each of these three forces. So let's go. So the next thing is to construct ourselves a force polygon. And we can start whichever vector we like. I think I'll start here on the left-hand side. And I'm going to bring along this, this force over here using my ruler and a set square. This is a handy technique that you can use. Um, you can create parallel lines just by moving an angled set square. Provided it slides on the ruler, you can develop parallel lines like this. So I'm going to transfer this down here and create a line of action there. I want it to be 40 newtons, which translates down to 20 millimeters, so to there. So I'm building a force polygon, which means that because of the principle of transmissibility of forces, I should be able to say that um, I can move the line of actions of the vectors so that they can go head to tail, and I can add them like that. Alright, so it's, here's a vertical force, this will be the 70 newton force, and of course it's going to be measuring down 30 millimetres. There it is there, so that's the 70 newton force, this is the 40 newton force. And lastly we've got the 50 newton force um, down here, coming along this line of action. You can see, and I'm going to switch it down to just about there here. So this is my line. Measure the distance, 50 newtons, according to my scale, equivalent to 25 millimetres. Now I need to be fairly accurate with this, as accurate as I can be anyway, so that, and there's my force polygon. Now that indicates that the resultant vector will be coming down from the top here. Remember it's a resultant, not an equilibrant, so it represents what force would create the same effect as all of these three forces put together. I'm going to call it R for resultant. Now, I can get magnitude and I can derive my um, 
my magnitude of the force and the direction just straight off the graph here like this. So using my trusty little set square here, I'm going to draw a line as close as I can. It's the vertical line there and I'll draw a horizontal line here so I can get the angle that I want right from here. Alright, so measuring using my protractor, if I set this up to zero down this way, which works for me, set it up in the centre, I can measure this up and see, okay, it's five, six, seven, be a bit more accurate here, it's about seven degrees, approximately seven degrees in here, which would make, of course, the larger angle over here, 90 minus seven, 83 degrees. Now, as far as the magnitude of the resultant goes, we can measure it. Let's measure it here. So it's, according to this, 65 millimetres. So at 10 newtons for um, 10 newtons for every 5 millimetres, I've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65. I've got... 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 130. So I've got approximately 130 newtons as my resultant, according to this, my current level of accuracy. So I could write out the resultant force based on this. Um, the resultant force um, is 130 newtons acting at 83 degrees from the horizontal uh, to my right. Again, okay, that's all very well and good, but what we need to do now is sort out how or exactly where will this force be acting along this beam so we can pinpoint where it goes through. And to do that we're going to use a system called the funicular polygon. And the funicular polygon relies on a standard polygon with the forces and what's called a polar diagram. And a polar diagram means that you select a point somewhere outside of these line of forces, these head to tail forces that you've done here. Pick a point and call it whatever you like. In this case I'm going to call it O. There's my point. And it could be anywhere, it doesn't really matter where it is, but somewhere convenient. And I'm going to draw some vector lines through the various different points of intersection or the head to tail of my vectors. In effect what I'm doing is splitting up these vectors into components that I can then superimpose on my free body diagram that you see up here to be able to lock in relative points of intersection of the forces on my free body diagram. So really bringing this force polygon and matching it up to the free body diagram. If you want to think of it, this force vector here, and let's give them some names, we'll use both notations, A, B, C, D, and E, which means this vector here becomes vector A, B, this vector here will be vector B, C, this one here, vector C, D, and um, we have a resultant poking out somewhere, we don't know quite know where. Alright, now we're going to trace this down. So this vector here, remember from looking up here, we've labelled it with Bose notation, is called CD. This one here will be BC. And this vector over here will be AB. Okay, that means that we can use two vectors now, if you like. We can break up this vector, CD, into two vectors, O. Call this these points. Yeah, this vector over here. O, we'll call it D. C, B, and A. So O D sounds a bit sus, doesn't it? O D vector O C vector O B vector O A. 
Alright? Now, the resultant, <coughs> pardon me, you'll notice goes from D to A. So let's work our way across and start substituting in these, these forces that we've, these vector lines that we've created. They're rays, really, that represent the head and tails of all these vectors. So these two vectors will represent, these two rays will represent this vector. OC and OB will represent vector BC. <coughs> and OB and OA will represent vector BA. Let's place them on top and we'll begin. Now, it's important when you do it that you start from the um, correct end. So the OD intersects vector CD. Now vector CD is here, so OD is going to come in onto vector CD. So let's use our ruler and um, system here and bring this vector up into position. Now sometimes if you can't quite get this right first go in terms of getting angles on your vectors you can turn your set square around and try and help yourself a little bit. This might help me a little touch if I do it like this. Yeah, put my ruler there, support, and bring that vector across up to here. So there's that line of action of vector OD. And it intersects simply vector vector CD, this vector here. So there it is. It started. So you can see it's got the same parallel line of action as this is vector OD. Now the next one is vector OC, and OC has a slightly different line of action. If I bring it up this way with my ruler and I bring it across into my free body diagram, there it is there. This becomes vector OC. I move along now to vector OB. All the way up to there. Vector OB. And lastly, I have vector OA down the bottom here. And I'm going to move vector OA to join onto vector AB down here. So it's got to go a little, little, little ways. There it is, to there. Now these last two, this vectors OA and OD are the two vectors that subtend and have points that go through the resultant. Now, the way the diagram works, which is quite neat now, is if I extend these two lines of my two vectors, I know that their point of intersection must be a point about which the resultant vector travels through. It's that point there. Now, with that point in view, I know the angle of my vector here, my resultant vector. So I'm going to transfer, using the principle of transmissibility of forces, transfer this vector, this one here, my resultant vector, to make it go through the point of contact. There it is. I'll make it go a dotted line so it's a bit easier to see through this mass of lines here. So it's going down through here like this. I know its length. There is its length. And its length is, according to this, 130 newtons. Yeah. So I step off the length to there. And there is my resultant vector coming almost through the midpoint of the beam. Just about, just to the left of the midpoint of the beam. So if I had to calculate it here, I put my ruler up there, maybe use the millimetres, and I'd say it's probably 39 millimetres. So if that distance is 39 millimetres from the edge, to calculate what that would mean, um, resultant vector acts at a point. Now to calculate that point, 39 millimetres, 
um, over some distance of x meters is going to be the same as 20 millimeters over 1 meter from my scale up here that I'm pointing to. So reversing that around, x is going to be x meters or that distance from the left hand side support to where the vector, the resultant vector starts to act. That distance here, x, is going to be equal to twenty. Let's just change it around. X over 39 equals 1 meter over 20. So X is going to equal to 1 meter times 39 millimeters divided by 20 millimeters. And on a calculator, that's going to be 39 divided by 20, 1.95 meters from the left support. So that we could write down over here that the resultant vector acts at a point 1.95 meters from the left hand side support of the beam at an angle of 83 degrees from the vertical. I'll just indicate it using showing which direction the 83 degrees is, just using the arrow convention like that. 83 degrees to the vertical. And that gives us everything. Um, so that's the solution, the graphical solution, using the, um, the polar diagram, which generates those rays onto your vector polygon, and then the funicular polygon, which is this one over here, from the Latin word funes, meaning a rope. So you're basically stringing together points, hence the name funicular polygon. And if you label your, um, your, your rays from your polar diagram, and just remember that each ray that you produce must intersect the force, the same corresponding force that it intersects on the polygon, it has to intersect that on your free body diagram and just follow the lines, the rays, in order like that, and they'll travel around. And then the last two rays are the ones that will intersect at points on the resultant vector. So extend those till they join, and then run your already worked out vector with its angle through that point, and you have its point of action on the beam.